Well, we are glad to have our students in the room with us today from first grade and up. I'm so glad you're in here. We'll try to keep you awake this morning. Uh, Lucas, would you come up and help us uh, by let's diving into God's Word this morning? So Lucas brought his fan club here today. Um, John, could you uh, get us a mic here? So we're in Psalm 51 to read today, and, and he, Lucas is going to start us there. And I'd love for you to get your copy of God's Word and that you will follow along with us. We're also going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is God's Word. Lucas, read our text today. Try it now. All right. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly through my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you have only sinned. Wait. Oh, against you I <laughs> have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in me, in the inward being. And teach me wisdom and seek your heart. The sacrifices, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. Thank you, Lucas. Well done. You take that. Take it. I want to talk today for a few minutes about how to come back from a fall. How to come back from a fall. I was reminiscing with a friend of mine about youth camp. And to this day, the smell of right guard brings back all the memories of youth camp. There's something unique about all the combo of smells that come from a guy's dorm. You know, and I was raised in Louisiana, so in that humidity, it was a smell of musty clothes and uh, perspiration and right guard and Joe Van Musk, any witnesses, anybody remember that? So it wasn't eternity cologne back then, it was Joe Van Musk. And all this, I think if they could bottle that up and sell it, it would be called Youth Camp. It's just like Youth Camp U de Toilette or whatever it's supposed to say. I had, a, I, I had a, a way of trying to cover up things when I was at Youth Camp. You know, just a can of right guard covers a multitude of sins. But there's some things that just can't be covered up. Some things that just Febreze will not do it. I had a funk in my car many years ago, and I was trying to figure out what the deal was, why, it, why that smell would come up. And I kept trying to get to the bottom of it. I kept, you know, vacuum and buy that little tree that you hang from your rearview mirror to make the car smell like fir trees from Colorado, and you know, I was doing all that, and it's just, and then it would smell better for a day or two, and then it would come back with a vengeance. So one Saturday, I said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to find out what is wrong with my car, and I pulled out the front seat. This really happened. Pulled out the front seat, looking for something, couldn't find anything. I finally pulled the panel off the door, and there behind the panel, stuck between some wires, was a dead mouse. And it had been there a while, folks. He had the maggots and everything. I mean, it was like, yeah, it was, that's exactly what I was saying. So I got rid of that, you know, with gas mask and gloves and pulled it out. And it was like, and then I thought, okay, the car's good now. The problem is the remnants of that have a way of just staying there. Some things that just seems like Febreze won't fix. You can cover it up as much as you want. The Bible tells us that our heart can be like that, that we can keep things in our heart long enough that it begins to affect us. It can be prejudice. It can be unforgiveness. It can be selfishness, greed. And we keep these things in our heart and we try to deal with it in a human way. And many of us, we try to just cover it up, pretend like it's not there. Well, God calls this, this way of hiding our offenses in our heart when we sin against others, 
Uh, we, we try to act like it's no big deal, and we hide it in our heart, and those things begin to change us. In fact, J.D. Greer says it like this, unconfessed sin changes us. It has a way of just putting a permanent mark, a stain, if you will, like in my car. It just begins to change you when you don't deal with it. Some things are appropriate to cover up. I'm glad if you guys came this morning covered up. Some things need to be hidden. Some, things, some smells need to be covered up. But unconfessed sin is not one of those. And what we typically do is we try to deal with it. One of the ways we try to deal with it is, first of all, we will blame shift. What do we do? When we, when we have sin in our life, we have ways that we've hurt other people, is that we will shift blame. We will say, hey, he did this. Or she knew what she was doing. He pushed my buttons. And the second way we deal with Sin is that we might put a spin on it. In the old days, we called it a lie. Today, we call it spin. Well, I'm just sharing this with you so you can pray. It's really gossip. Or it's not prejudice, it's just the facts. That's the way those people are. And this denial, this way of covering up begins to change us. And over time, even, even those who lie will begin to believe the lie. If you say it enough, it just becomes part of you. And we're, we're in this time in David's life in 2 Samuel where David is in this period of a big cover-up. If you were with us last week, you know the story how that David took advantage of a woman. He stole something that wasn't his. And he tries to cover it up and he has someone, someone's life taken by sending a letter. And he uses his power to take what isn't his. But as we saw last time, second chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 27 says, the thing that David did displeased the Lord. God knew. It's covered up to everybody else as far as David was concerned. But God knew. And it displeased the Lord. I don't know exactly how long he lived in this netherworld of cover up. I think it was months that he, he thought, I'm good. Perhaps now Bathsheba, as she's getting ready to have a baby and she's in the palace now and she's decorating the nursery with a little bit of baby blue but maybe reserving some pink just in case. And David and Joab, the commander, they don't talk about what happened. They don't talk about Uriah. But when Bathsheba walks in the room, Joab conveniently looks the other way. And then maybe Memorial Day comes along and David, King David, does his duty, goes out to the cemetery and he gives a speech about bravery, about those who have lost their lives for their country. Maybe he places a wreath on Uriah's grave. But the thing that David did displeased the Lord. So what will God do? What does God do when he loves somebody like he loves David? but knows that he is estranged from him because of his sin. Will God send armies? Will he send a famine? Will he send cancer? No, he will send a man. And he sends a man named Nathan. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Nathan with 61 well-chosen words, telling a story and as far as David is concerned, David thinks, well, I'm hearing a case because that's what kings do. They hear cases and they determine what is the just way out of this. And he's heard these kinds of cases before. Nathan begins and he says, there was a, there was a rich man and there was a poor man. And this rich man, he had a seven-figure salary and he had a 401k that was off the chain and he had a beautiful family and kids, had everything he wanted, 
planning to retire early, had a freezer full of beef and pork, but he was having some Jewish friends over and they wanted lamb. And so he has these friends over and and he's remembering, I don't have any lamb in the freezer, but then it dawns on him, my warehouse manager just bought a lamb for his kids on Easter. So he sends his assistant over to ask for the lamb. He says, the king needs it, or the rich man needs it. And they bring the lamb in, and the kitchen help does what the kitchen help does. And they prepare the lamb for dinner, and they have lamb chops and lamb fritters lamb pie. The Jewish friends say, this is the best we've ever had. This is awesome. Thank you so much. The next day, the warehouse manager says, can I have my lamb back because the kids really miss it? He says, oh, you didn't know. They served him up last night. Well, the warehouse manager can't do anything because he needs a job, so he doesn't say anything and Life moves on. At this point in the story, the king is listening, and the narrator says that at that point that David was filled with rage. And he says, this man shall repay four times because he had no pity. There's this long pause as Nathan is standing there And he raises that hand and points it at the king and says, you are the man. And he continues saying what God has sent him to say. Nathan says, God says, I chose you. I brought you from Bethlehem. I set you on the throne. I gave you the kingdom. You could have even had more if you would ask for it. But what did you do? You despised God's word, and you have killed Uriah. At this point, David is confronted, and he realizes there's no more cover-up. I can't cover this anymore. And what will David do? What do we do when we're confronted with what we've been trying to hide? And God says, I know, and I love you too much to just act like nothing happened. I want us to notice, first of all, that God takes our offenses personally. We sometimes think, well, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with God. I'm just, I'm just living my life. I'm just, you know, pursuing the American dream. I'm just trying to be happy, and, you know, I didn't mean any harm by it, but God takes it personally. God says, you despised my word. And God says, Because of this, there are going to be consequences. I can't reverse the process of sowing and reaping. I can't reverse the process of James 1.15 when it says, desire, when it has conceived, brings forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Therefore, the baby in Bathsheba's womb is going to die, and the sword will never pass from your family. Death will continue to come. And David, what will he do when, it, when he's confronted? What do we do? David, I don't know if he stands, I don't know if he falls on his knees, but these six words tumble out of his mouth. I have sinned against the Lord. Beautiful. And he continues. We don't know if he continued that day, if he picked up his harp again, Because I have to believe, as Matthew Henry says, that during this period of time where he had done the cover-up and he's being confronted by Nathan that his harp had gotten out of tune and his pen that he had written the Psalms with was laying over there dry as dust, but now he picks it back up. And he writes these words, the psalmist writes these words in Psalm 51 that Lucas just read for us. He writes these after being confronted. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, O God. 
look at my transgressions and erase them and cause them to be blotted out. And, and as he's crying this prayer, we call this repentance. This is saying, I did it. I'm owning my part. I'm not going to blame shift anymore. I'm not going to spin this. And as he's making his way back from this fall, what is it that God wants from you, from me? What he wants is a humble heart. David writes this in Psalm 51, verse 15, and verse 16 and 17. What, what is it that God wants? He says, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You would not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices are of God are broken spirit. Say this part with me, a broken and contrite heart. Contrite's not a word we use a lot today. It simply means to be surrendered, to let go. In other words, saying no more cover up. A broken and contrite heart. Heart matters with God. That's what we're looking at. When it comes to repentance, when it comes to coming back from a fall, what does God want? He wants a humble heart. There's only one kind of heart that God resists. Only one kind of heart that God can't help. It's a proud heart. James, the brother of Jesus, says it in this way in verse chapter four, verse six, God opposes the proud. But guess what? He gives grace to the humble. He pours it out. Abundant. But for the one who says, Hey, it's not my problem. This is the difference between Saul and David. King Saul, his predecessor, when he was confronted by the prophet, he was kind of like, hey, you know, hey, I, I'm just saying, you know, I, this wasn't my fault. This was the people, not David. David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And because of that, God responds, but when we say, I want law and justice for other people, but I want mercy for myself, that kind of heart God actually opposes. Are we ever like that? Are we ever like David that when we're first hearing of something that we automatically move toward, oh, well, that's not right, as David did. He's filled with anger. That man should pay back four times. He had no pity. Am I ever like that? You know, when you hear someone abusing the welfare system and you think, I paid thousands of dollars in taxes and they get by with that? Where is the law enforcement? Or when you're standing in line at the grocery counter and you're in the express lane and it clearly says 12 items. And you, you're the law-abiding citizen. You, you even made sure that, hey, I'm not going to count this bag of apples as 10. I, it's just one package. And, you know, I've got my ducks in a ro row. And you count the person in front of you, and they've got 13. When an ex-prisoner moves into the neighborhood, you say, I hope they don't move in next to us. Where is law enforcement when you need it? Or you're driving the speed limit, but man, there's those other two cars. Where is law enforcement when we need it? Key phrase, when we need it, when we want it. The rest of the time, I just want mercy. This is the scandalous mercy of God, and, and it sometimes bothers us to think, how can we just say, have mercy on me, O oh God, and then God says, okay. That's scandalous. How can we admit our sins and our weaknesses? And God says, okay, I'll remove your sin. This is what happens for David. Nathan says, God says, I have removed your sin. Wow. Imagine that. Imagine David suddenly feeling the weight of what he had been carrying and then the mercy of God running full force his direction. Suddenly the dam broke, that dam of cover-up, of saying, I, I'm good, I've got this behind me, but then God busting it open through confession, and then the mercy of God reaching him. And David once again experiencing the presence of God that had been isolated from him because he had been changed by his unconfessed sin. 
And somebody says, well, that's not fair, is it? I mean, where is justice for Bathsheba? Where is justice for Uriah? Where is justice for the, the little baby? That, that's just not fair. I mean, the king gets the wife and he gets to move on. Remember that sin, when it is finished, brings death, and there would be death. The death of a baby, the death of relationships in his family, that David would continue to feel the sword right near him, yet God would forgive in his great mercy because of a broken and contrite heart. My wife and I were driving one night and we were heading down the outer road and getting ready to turn toward our house. As we're coming up to the four-way stop sign, I'm getting ready to turn, got my turn signal on like a good boy, and there's this other car that's coming toward us, toward the four-way stop. And my wife said, wait, I don't think they're stopping. And I slam on the brakes. And that car goes screaming by, just within inches. And then I, I turn, and I'm shaking, because I realized that had I not stopped, that that car would have slammed into my sweet wife. And for the moment, I'm thinking about where's law enforcement when you need it. I'm thinking about the danger of that. I'm, I'm thinking about was that car full of drunk teenagers or who's getting by? And yet God in his mercy let me live to see another day. But I have to also ask myself the question, have I ever been distracted? Have I ever run a stop sign? Have, have I ever looked at my phone when I shouldn't have? Have I ever gone the wrong way down a one-way street? Am I saying, where is law enforcement when I need it, when I'm sometimes the guilty one? And how can God forgive us? How can he be just in his mercy? Here's how God did it is God allowed his only son, his one and only lamb, to be put in the intersection of humanity and sin. And it wasn't a car of drunk teenagers that hit Jesus Christ. It was all the sinners of the world, me and you behind that wheel, that screamed into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the sins, past, present, and future. God says that he laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. So God is just. How can he forgive David? How can he forgive us? Because God let his lamb receive the penalty for your sin so that you and I can go running into the arms of mercy. Receive God's full grace. I wanna just say to anybody in the room today that you say, I don't deserve that. Welcome to the party. I don't either. But I wanna say in Jesus' name, I'm reaching out to take all I can get because I need it today. Anybody with me? That we need the mercy of God. Romans 5 and 1 says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that the name of the next son that David would have, his name means peace? Solomon, taken from the word shalom. The same word that's translated into our English language in Romans 5 and 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have shalom. We have Solomon. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we call it amazing grace, scandalous mercy, because we don't deserve it. But whosoever will say, have mercy on me. I have sinned against the Lord. Small, big, 
perverts, pedophiles, murderers, pimps, and people who have stuff hidden in their heart. God forgives. I want to close just by speaking primarily to two different groups of people in the room. One group, perhaps those of you that's trying to deal with sin your way, cover it up, blame shift, spin it. Why don't you just say, it's me, Lord. I need you. Have mercy on me. Just reach out and take the mercy of God for yourself. Receive it. Another group here today is perhaps as I'm listing these things and we're recounting David's story, you say, man, I, I've done some things. My life is just, it's not pretty at all. In fact, even though I'm born again, I just can't seem to let it go. How about today you just dive in to the mercy of God? That rushing river so clean and pure, you just say, I'm in. And I'm gonna forgive myself. I'm gonna believe that God's mercy is enough. Have mercy on me, oh God. And God says, yes. Will you receive that today? I wanna pray for anyone in the room that perhaps you're in one of those categories. Maybe you're somebody who'd say, I've been covering it up for a while. I've just been trying to deal with my life my own way. You would say, I want, I want to come home to Jesus. And perhaps you would say, I just can't seem to forgive myself. But now, today, you would say, have mercy on me. And then just believe that God is running to meet you. God's mercy, so abundant, so rich. Don't lower the cross to your level. It was a high price Jesus paid so you and I could enjoy mercy. Just receive it why we call it amazing. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much that you sent your only son, perfect lamb from heaven, to receive the penalty of our sin so that we could walk without shame into your presence, confidence to receive all that you've given to us and for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we say yes today. Lord, I'm praying for those here in this room, perhaps those watching, who need to come home to you. That today would be the day that they would say yes. For those, Lord, who can't forgive themselves, that they too would receive the mercy of God, walk in freedom. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let this be the day in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, while we're bowed, bowing for just a moment, can I ask you that are in the room that you wanna come home to the Lord today? Could be that you've just been away for so long and you can't really remember why. Perhaps you've been in a season of just trying to cover it up and spin it and deal with it or blame shift. You say, I want to come home to God, and I, I want to say, have mercy on me, oh God. Or perhaps you need to forgive yourself. You say, I need the mercy of God today. I want to experience it deeply in my life again. If that's you, while we're bowing for just a moment, would you slip up your hand so I can pray with you one more time and just believe with you that you're coming home today. Just go ahead, slip up your hand wherever you are in the room. I'm coming home to Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, son. Yep, sir. Thank you. Over here on my right, up in the balcony. And thank you, sir. Yes, you, sir. Who else today? Coming home to the Lord today. Receive you, Savior. Yeah, son. Thank you. Back in the back. See you. Yeah, over here, God bless you. Thank you for being brave. I wanna come home to the Lord. Yeah, you here in the middle. Here's what I invite you to do together with us this morning. Um, Tiffany, if you could put up on the screen Psalm 51, these first few verses of Psalm 51, have mercy. 
on me, oh God. And if we could just read this together. Would you look up, everyone in the room, let's say this together. Have mercy on me, oh God. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Let's stop right there. The Bible says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all righteousness. You receive God's mercy today. Look to him. Be honest with him. As we close in just a moment, I'm gonna invite you, if you wanna come and pray, I have some folks up here to pray with you. If you wanna go to next step as you go through the doors, to your left, there's a place where you can talk to someone and say, what does it mean to follow Jesus? How do I get baptized? What's the importance of that? I don't understand. And they'll help you with your next step of faith in following Jesus for God's glory. You do that, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand today. Those of you that name Jesus Christ as Lord and God as your Father, you can receive this today. May the Lord bless and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you, lift his countenance upon you, and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us today. So good to be with you.